So this morning, I wanted to talk about a topic that um, I hope resonates. I hope resonates with everybody here. And it's really hard, and it's a, a challenge listening to what's going on in the world today. Uh, the news of not just here locally, regionally, or even nationally. The, uh, the gloves have gone on for this presidential race, and it's, as you'd expect, the, the same lies, deceit, and, and trying to make the other guy look as dumb and as slow and as bad as possible. And there's probably truth to all of it. And looking at what's going on in Europe and Asia and the Middle East and the wars and the countries joining NATO and the other countries threatening for joining NATO and what's going on in the Far East with China and Taiwan and all of that. Humans being humans. The topic today, Hope in God While the World Crumbles, it resonates with me because I remember as a young teenager reading this verse, these, these verses in Psalm 146 through, through, 3 through 5. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. The interesting thing is that this was written by a man who was a prince. He was a leader. He was a king. And yet his instruction and his recommendation is don't put trust in kings. Don't put trust in princes. Don't put trust in men. And I've mentioned it before, but there's a president, uh, George Bush Sr., that said, read my lips, no new taxes. And what happened? I was just a, a teenager, so, I mean, taxes, were that's something my mom and dad had to deal with, right? Because I didn't realize that that also affected me. My thought process wasn't that developed. And then a few years later, there was a man that said that he did not have a relationship with Monica Lewinsky. And that was an uproar because a president was caught lying. I remember that, that, I mean, he should be removed from office because he was lying. And now every president lies every time they open their mouth. Maybe that was true then. Was that true then? Okay, okay. See, I wasn't paying attention because I was 12 or 13 or 14 when these things happened. But I remember very much that how, how terrible it was that George Bush said there wouldn't be any taxes and then there were taxes. And David said thousands of years ago, don't put your trust in the princes of men. So it doesn't sound like things have changed. As kids in, in this congregation, we learn what, which verse here, kids? What verse do we come here to learn usually? I see a lot of really old kids <laughs> raising their hands up. Any little kids? Four? Okay, page says four. So we usually come here to verse four and we apply it to ourselves, right? That his or man's breath goes forth, he returns to his earth, and in that very day his thoughts perish, right? Is that true? Does that happen to us? But really, what is this verse saying? Who is the his? It's the king. So if you put your trust in the king, or if you put your trust in the prince of man, or in mankind, we're putting our trust in something that's going to perish. We're putting our, our trust in something that there is no help. So when I, when I learned this, and I understood that the guy who's the king was writing, don't trust him effectively. Don't put your hope in him. Don't put your salvation and, and don't build your life around what this guy says and what this guy's going to do because he's going to expire. But instead to put that faith in God, it clicked for me. It was something that resonated with me. And it's been reinforced in the decades since then as I see the world crumble around us. I don't have faith that mankind is going to find all the answers. I don't have hope that they're going to fix all the problems. So we're going to go through just a few of the 
major problems that we all experience, both personally and as an entire group and as a planet. So the reality of turmoil, we've got five different topics that I want to cover pretty quickly today. We have political unrest. Governments around the globe are grappling with division, unrest, and the quest for stability. Is that, still, is that true today? Do we have instability? Do we have governments that are grappling with political unrest? Do we have, do we have that here in the United States? Do we have that in Ukraine? Do we, does every country have to grapple with this? Do we have any real hope that mankind is going to solve this issue? Every time I, I turn around, mankind is trying to grapple with it, and things look like they're getting worse. The global pandemic that we just came out of a few years ago. Ongoing challenges po posed by infectious diseases. Did, did this one disease cause problems globally? Did it disrupt economies? Did it make, make things change, move around? And in Revelation, it indicates there's more of this to come. It indicates that there's going to be sickness, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be plagues that come during the last day. So this is going to get worse. And yet, what is mankind doing about it? They're investing more and more and more to see how they could make more deadly bugs to wipe out their enemies. They're trying to make the bugs stronger to use against the enemy because that's how infectious diseases work, right? You can just target people and it doesn't spread globally like we just saw. How about economic uncertainty? Anybody heard about the word inflation in the last few years or housing prices? Mankind thinks that they're going to fix this by doing what? Printing more money. Oh, well, that caused a problem. That's inflation now. Now the, the $2 per gallon of, of milk or gas or whatever is double that or triple that or whatever it is. Who here remem remembers paying less than a dollar a gallon for gas? I did for about a week in 1999. It was 92 cents. 1999. 92 cents. I don't know what happened, but it was great. Who here remembers when 90 cent, 92 cents would have been outrageous for a gallon of gas? Uh, not me. But <laughs> Lou Longarm remembers. Three gallons for a dollar. That's a bargain. Sign me up. <laughs> Who here wants to get an electric vehicle or has an electric vehicle because they're tired of paying for gas? I see a few. Joel, hand. <laughs> Tesla man. Okay. Yeah. So the idea that Man is going to conquer this economic uncertainty, this instability with economics, not likely. How feasible is it for a young couple under the age of, say, 30 to be able to buy a house today? Yeah. How many of us were able to buy a house by the time we were 30? Quite a few. Almost all of us have gray hair somewhere, right? So it's not getting better. How about personal struggles? Anybody have personal struggles? <laughs> I just listened to a podcast today, or not today, this week, about how in medicine, every field of medicine over the last 50 years has been making progress. They've been getting better at diagnosing things and fixing things from hearts, brains, all, all of the physical things, right? They just implanted a chip in a human for the first time, and they're really hopeful that that's going to help. However, this man said that in every field of medicine except for one, they're making advancements and they're making people more healthy. What one category do you think that is that they're failing at, that things are getting worse? I'm hearing something. Mental. Mental health. And they know more about mental health today than they've known ever. They know how the brain works. They have drugs that help. They have drugs that can that can really help some of these things, and yet the suicide rates are going up. Why is that? Is it because we're putting too much trust and too much hope in man, in the princes of men? Is it because more and more people are turning away from God? If you don't have a God that you have to answer to, 
who do you have to answer to? You lean on your own understanding. So I don't have any hope or faith that the personal struggles of each one of us is going to be cured by man. How about geopolitical tensions? We talked about this a little, a little bit, but Biden's been saying the last few weeks that he's going to work on getting a ceasefire between Israel and Gaza. What's Israel say about that? Israel says, I, we, we plan to wipe out Hamas. And you do not wipe out Hamas with a ceasefire. That's not how that works. And what's Hamas say? We want to push Israel out of the land. In fact, they'd like to eradicate them globally. And that's been kind of a theme on this planet for a while. So I don't have any faith that we're going to cure geopolitical tensions as man. What does God offer us? Well, for, for political unrest, God tell, or God's words in Proverbs 21, verses 1 through 3. Same guy here, right? The king's heart is like, the, is like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do righteousness and justice is desired by the Lord more than sacrifice. So God is the one that's in charge of this world. God is guiding the political rivers that ebbs and flows of this world as he wishes. He's the one that gets to decide when things are bad enough that he hits the reset button. As bad as it's gotten, it's going to get worse. So where should we put our hope? God also has the ability in verse 2 to weigh the heart. How many of us feel like our intentions are good? Overall, I see you all sitting in this room, right? That's a good step on making your intentions good. We all like to think that our intentions are good, that our ways are going to be right. But we come here in this room so that we can measure them against what God's words are, what God's instruction is, what God's righteousness is and judgment. Otherwise, we fall pray to the first, the first sentence there in chapter 2. Every, man, every man's way is right in his own eyes. If we didn't compare what our thoughts and what our ideas and what our plan was with God's, that's where we would end up. How about for global, plan, global pandemics? <laughs> Psalm 91, 1 through 4. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Notice that this is still Psalm. This is still a prince of man. This is still a king that's writing these things. Where does he put his hope? Where does he put his faith? He puts his trust in God. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper, and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with all with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. So we had the top doctors on the planet working on this COVID thing for years, and it's still affecting us today. That's not what I'm looking for when I want protection from a pestilence or from a, a plague. I want a cure, or I want it to never happen. And God promises us that in his plan, he's going to get rid of all sickness. The doctors couldn't do it. What they did is they tamed it. So now we got another cold and flu that's going to hit us every year for the rest of our lives and our children's lives. Now we got three things that we're going to need to be worried about on a consistent annual basis. And like I said, in book of Revelation, it says there's going to be more. So that's great. And none of the other things that have afflicted human, human beings for centuries or, or millennia are cured. 
cancer is still a problem. How many here have heard about what's going on with uh, antibiotic resistant diseases? Stuff we thought we had handled like strep throat. What's going on with those? They're working diligently to overcome our little band-aids like antibiotics. God's the one that says that I will remove all sickness. I put my hope in him. How, how about for the next topic, economic uncertainty? Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12, Paul writes, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Now, Adam and his teen class talked about this a little bit today. Is that right? Yeah. They were talking about whether, whether or not life was designed to be fair. You guys have heard the concept of the 1%, the super, super wealthy that own like 80% of the entire 80% of the entire world's wealth is controlled by 1% of the people or something ridiculous like that. And yet, Paul writes here what he lives his life by. He's content with what he has. God tells us that he takes care of the sparrows. He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the lilies of the field. He takes care of things. So don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have enough worry for itself. And Paul says he had to learn. This isn't something that comes natural because naturally we just want more and more and more and more, which is why the 1% is where the 1% is because they put their hope in riches and in monetary value. David saw through that and said, that guy's going to die. And he who dies with the most money still dies. Paul says he's content with whatever circumstances he's in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And this one, I think, is really hard, especially for this country and us. The American dream, right? We all want a house. We all want things. We all want a nice place to live. And those aren't bad things in and of themselves. But aren't they a distraction? Can any house or magnificent mansion or, or amazing property that we build today even compare to the house that God's planning for us? One that's miles thick walls of precious jewels and unbelievably tall walls and the brightest light in the universe at the center of that. We couldn't, we couldn't even fathom building a house that compares to that. And Paul touches the other part of this. I know how to live in prosperity. What if we do find ourselves in a prosperous situation? <clears throat> Apparently there's a godly way of living with that too. Is it to hoard more? Is it to help? Personal struggles. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. This one resonates with all of us. We all have personal troubles. We all have to overcome. We all have a test, and it's different for every one of us. Again, Adam's class about what, what, what's fair. Is life fair? Well, God's the one that's fair. Remember, he's the one that judges the heart. He made us. He knows what we can handle, and he's going to test us. Because he wants us to choose him. That's the whole test. Every time. It's a really easy thing. You just have to choose the right choice every time. For your whole life. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Isn't this put your hope and trust in him? Come to me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We could spend our entire lives trying to be a political influence, trying to be uh, in the world and make this place a better place. And from what I see, it doesn't accomplish anything. Because at the end of our life, whether we 
put it towards God or whether we put it towards worldly things, the test ends. And then we're left with whatever we invested disappearing. Whatever we put our time into, it's not even a thought anymore because you're dead. The hope of mankind, the hope without God, is gone. There's nothing else. But the hope that is presented in the Bible is that God's going to make things right after a short period of sleep. That God is going to call those who put their hope in him and he's going to raise them to a perfected world. One where there is no sickness. One where all of these five topics have been solved and resolved. And he's going to do the work because he's the only one that can. Geopolitical tensions. Apparently they had some back in David's time. You guys ever heard the word the Philistines? They were a cantankerous bunch. They caused some tension. In Psalm 46, verses 8 through 10, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease. To the end of the earth, he breaks the bow and bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So it's not NATO that's going to end all strife. Right? I just learned this week that uh, Sweden has joined NATO. And surprising to nobody, Russia threatened that they were going to blow up everybody. I didn't live through much of the Cold War, but I saw the end of it. And what it looks like is we're seeing the beginning of another one. And I don't think that that cycle's going to end. I think that nations are going to be fighting nations until God says, all right, that's enough. And he's the one that ends it all. He's the one that breaks all the weapons of mankind. And he's the one that ends the striving. And he, in, the, in the last part of verse 10, he says, I will be exalted in the earth. I will be exalted among the nations. This requires the first part of verse 10. Cease from striving and know that I am God. Do we think that the nations are just going to throw down all their arms and go, okay, yeah, God's got this? Without him forcing them to? We're going to transition now into what the Bible and what God has in store for us. The source of our hope, our hope that's rooted in God. And I've summarized here a handful of verses that kind of encapsulate what it is that God tells us he's providing for us or he's going to provide and the hope that we have for him, that God is our safe spot and always ready to help. That God doesn't change. He set his plan in motion and he intends for his plan to happen. That every good gift and perfect gift comes from God. And that God way, God's way is perfect and his word is true. How much would this make sense if his word wasn't true? We'd be wasting a whole bunch of time. That God's word is here to stay sounds a lot like that God's plan is going to happen. And that God remains true to his character. He's not going to change his mind. He's set it in place. He's got the plan going, and it will happen. God's plan for you. Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 13. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you, to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. 
Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. God states here to his children of Israel that he has plans for them. That he has plans for welfare and not for calamity. And he extended this to the Gentiles through Christ. That we could also become partakers in this this plan. God's deliverance and his nearness. Psalm 34, 17 through 19. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Now, does that happen right now in this life? Something to think about. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I think about some of the personal struggles that I've had. And when compared to what God's promises are, what my hope is, they become almost nothing. They become insignificant when compared to what God promises. And they're real struggles in this life. Many have struggles that are more than what I've had to deal with. There are things that that can happen that are truly terrible. And yet what God says is that he's going to wipe every tear from our eye. That he's going to reward us so over the top that the former things will be forgotten. The former things are passed away. God's strength and his support. Isaiah 40, 29 through 31. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Yeah, putting your trust in the princes of men or even in your own thoughts. I remember being 20 and thinking, I was super strong, super healthy, super almost invincible. And then two weeks ago, I hurt my neck and I was down for two weeks and I don't even know what I did. But I tried to sit up here in these chairs and I went down to the green rocking chair and I sat there for the rest of church because that's how invincible I was, right? And then my wife had to go get me a heat pad that I had to use for a week in my comfy chair because I was just so strong and powerful. Point being is that what Isaiah is saying here is that you, the youthfulness does not last forever. What happens to man happens to man. And we get a taste of what it's like to be strong We get a taste of what it's like to be healthy. And then that starts to go away. And we have to learn or choose where our hope's going to lie. And God's strength and his support doesn't go away. He doesn't get a sore neck. He doesn't get old. He doesn't get forgetful. He doesn't have a cough. He doesn't. How about security in God's plan? We read a couple of verses there saying that his plan he intends to fulfill and that he doesn't change. In Romans chapter 15, verses 10 through 13, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Just so we're clear, that's us, Gentiles, not Jews, Gentiles. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may not overflow with hope or so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Yeah, when we stop thinking that mankind's going to solve all the, the issues that mankind made. Has anybody heard the phrase, faith in humanity restored? Usually it's followed by a picture of someone being nice to a puppy. That does not restore my faith in humanity. That's a nice thing, and puppies are cute, yes. But I don't have faith in humanity. Humanity has uh, been running amok for thousands of years, and things are getting worse. No, our faith and our hope needs to be placed in God. He's the one that will bring peace and stability on this planet. God's comfort and peace, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, we have an avenue of making requests with God. We have the ability to pray to him. He knows what we need. He also knows how our story in this life is going to end. He knows what his purpose for us is. But the promise is that he's going to protect. He's going to keep you if you keep him. He will guard your hearts and your mind. So in other words, God, God's got it. God's everlasting love. Romans 8, verses 37 through 39. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't, oh, I don't know why it does that. Our Lord. So, there's nothing in there that God can't overcome if we put our hope in Him. A lot of things listed in chapter, or in verse 38 and 39, are, don't that sound like personal struggles? Is death a personal struggle? Yeah, death's the enemy. Can God overcome death? He's given us an example of that in Christ. Are there, are there any, is there anything outside of this list that could keep us from God if we choose him? So God's love is everlasting. The only caveat is whether or not we choose him. God's provision in his care, Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Isn't that us? Yep, that's still us. We do seek those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is the cart and the horse analogy. We need to get the horse in front, and that is that we need to be seeking God's kingdom, God's righteousness, and those other things will fall into place. He will provide. At the end of this, the call to action here being Galatians 6, 9. Don't grow weary of doing good things, right? We're to, be, we're to be a light in the darkness. And whose light is it that we're trying to shine? Whose light is it that we're trying to reflect? It's not our own. Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16 summarized, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others. Ephesians 2, verse 10. We are created for good works. Walk in the good works prepared for us. In James 2.17, faith without works is dead and our actions demonstrate our faith. And in 1 Corinthians 15.58, be steadfast and immovable in the work of the Lord because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. So comparing this to Psalm 146, the labor that we put on this work, on this uh, 
earth for our family and for ourselves. Just the mundane things. That stuff's in vain. It doesn't matter how many meals we ate, we still are going to die. It doesn't matter how healthy those meals were, we're still going to die. But the stuff that counts, the stuff that God attributes as righteousness, that work is not in vain. That's where I place my hope. God's promises are like a rock that we can stand on. He doesn't change. He's got our backs, right? He has it. His plans are for us to all good things and hope. His plans for us are all about good things and hope. That's what the whole plan of the kingdom is. He's there to comfort us and give us strength and to show us the way forward. Let's stick to what God has promised for us. Let's live out the hope of God and be a light, be a beacon of his love and change in the world. So we could use a little bit more of both. Let's go ahead and close with a song. finish our service today with song number 62, A Shelter in the Time of Storm, 62. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and stand. God and Father in heaven, we come to you today to learn more about your will for us and incorporate that into our lives, that we can be a light and an example to those around about us. We ask that you forgive us when we sin against you, and that we find the strength to come back to you and to follow your words once again. We ask that you save us all a place in that kingdom that's promised, 
and that that day may come soon. We ask you to be your will, and in Jesus' name, amen.